Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. I will wait until 8.30 to call the case. So we have about a minute and 15 seconds. Court will call State of Wisconsin versus Darrow E. Brooks, case number 21 CF 1848. May I have the appearances, please. Uh, good morning, Judge Sue Upper, Leslie Basie, and Zach Wichow appearing for the state. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Appearance, please. Uh, good morning, Your Honor. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Darrow Brooks, Jr. Um, I'm here for this matter by special appearance. It is not my uh, intention to bring any controversy. To you, Your Honor, your court today, um, I'm wondering how I may settle this matter. Um, is there anyone here in the court that can give me a rendering of the account? Please, if it Mr. pleases Brooks, your, your Honor. Mr. says noted. Uh, the court will not be responding to that last question. We are here today to start the sentencing hearing in this case. Uh, this, of course, following your conviction on all counts following the jury trial that concluded um, in late October. I will acknowledge, sir, there are a number of documents you filed today. One is a motion for stay pending appeal. There are two ICFs that came in as well, both addressed to me. One related to court costs and fees, requesting a copy of the record at the court's expense, and then the other one also requesting a certified copy of the record written and recorded uh, statement that you're waiving all fees and court costs and that you would be appearing by special appearance. Um, the court's not gonna take these up initially, sir. Um, in order for a court to consider a motion for stay pending appeal, the matter must be finally adjudicated. Uh, including uh, the signing of a judgment of conviction. Uh, once that is done, I will schedule the motion for stay pending appeal accordingly. That way the state can also have proper notice of that and be prepared to address that with the court in terms of your request to waive costs and fees. Um, I will interpret your written ICFs as a request that at sentencing I waive costs associated with these convictions to the extent that is allowable under the law. As far as the record is concerned, this court is not the custodian. As far as the anything in the written record or the file, the clerk of court is the custodian. As far as the uh, official transcripts of the proceedings, uh, those will need to be prepared. Uh, and there are costs associated with that. And there is a form that you or a lawyer acting on your behalf would need to file in order for this court to consider that. Uh, so I'll take all of that under advisement, but will not be addressing that specifically other than what I have just noted. Uh, the other thing I want to take up preliminarily before uh, I hear from individuals who are here to make statements is the letter that I sent to the parties um, yesterday. It does address one topic that I wanted to address at the beginning of the hearing today, and that is your request for 
individuals to speak at sentencing did not contain a request that they appear by Zoom. And I wanted to clarify that with you, sir, if you were requesting that they appear by Zoom and make their statements if they're not present in the courtroom on your behalf when the appropriate time comes. Um, yes, um, I, I apologize for that, Your Honor. I didn't know that it was it some type of uh, step that I was supposed to include in that to make sure that they would appear by Zoom. I'm a little confused, so I, I apologize for Sir, that. Sir, I don't know where any of these individuals live, whether they are local and can make it here or not. Um, and I had anticipated that either of the parties, if there was a request for someone to appear by Zoom, that would be specifically made so that I could then take the appropriate steps. There is time. My intention would be that when uh, the state has rested their portion of the sentencing hearing, all of their speakers have spoken and they have given their sentencing argument uh, that I would uh, depending on where it's at, probably take a break, start up the Zoom at that point, allow the individuals who wish to make a statement on your behalf to do so one at a time. But otherwise, I wasn't going to keep the Zoom up because the proceedings are being live streamed. Um, is that acceptable to you, sir? Uh, in, in part, um, so I'm, I'm still a little confused on um, how would I get the... Uh, Zoom link to those who wish to speak on my behalf. My understanding is your mom has contacted the clerk of court's office. Um, I haven't addressed that in any way, but I would then give my staff permission to reach out to her. I believe she has left her phone number and we could do that and provide that Zoom information to her. And I presume she would be able to get it to the individuals on your list. It's very important though, that only those individuals appear on the Zoom. That's the only people I will approve. Um, unless they're here in court, of course. Uh, and then the other parameters are that um, that individuals who are on the Zoom for that portion of the sentencing hearing keep their microphones off, their cameras off, until they are making a statement. And they have to be identified with, uh, obviously, the name that was provided by you and only those individuals. What I don't want to see is, you know, one person and then 10 people behind them. That's not what I approved. So. Um, do you understand that, sir? Uh, I have a quick question about that. Like right. one, one of the um, people that wish to speak on my behalf would be uh, the mother of my youngest daughter. And I'm not sure when exactly she'll be speaking. And it, it's a chance that she would actually have my daughter with her with that. How old is your daughter? She's eight. As long as the child is remains quiet and doesn't interrupt, I will allow that one exception. Okay, thank you. All right, so I will instruct uh, Madam Clerk to let uh, my other clerk know that the Zoom information can be released uh, to your mom. There's a meeting ID and passcode, uh, and that can be provided to the other individuals on the list. And I'll. I anticipate that that won't be until sometime this afternoon that we get to that portion of the sentencing hearing. So if they have, um, as I know my grandmother would like to speak and she's very elderly. So if she has any um, trouble like accessing it, will someone probably on my behalf be able to walk her through that? Or? Well, I assume she might need help with that or that yeah, will be available. She's 80. so. I don't, I don't think she's, well, I, I know that she's not the most. I trust they will have sad. that all figured out, sir. So, all right. All right, then. Is there anything else uh, the parties wish me to address preliminarily before I turn to the state? Yes, Your Honor, I do have a few preliminary matters, please. Uh, the filings that you just referenced from Mr. Brooks, I did not see those in the electronic queue this morning. Uh, would it be possible for the state to get copies, please? Yes, they, I believe, were hand-delivered. Or Zach may be, Mother Clerk Zach may be doing that right now. We'll make sure, but Teresa can make copies for you as well. Okay. I, I also wanted to ask uh, a couple of housekeeping matters, Your Honor, as far as uh, timing and scheduling. If we complete the hearing today, then I assume that eliminates the need for the hearing tomorrow. Is that correct? Or do you see a, a, 
version where we come back tomorrow no matter what. I do see a version where we come back tomorrow no matter what. I, I want to be able to digest the statements from everyone um, and process them accordingly. There's going to be quite a few for both sides, and I think it's appropriate that I take the overnight to do that and come back tomorrow to render okay. the sentence. Okay, thank you. That, that's very helpful. Um, the other uh, question is we have the easel uh, back in the courtroom. Some people did want to display some foam boards. Um, if it meets the court's approval, we'll leave it at this location and then just uh, pass up the uh, exhibits and Detective Reglin can display them if that's okay with the court. Well, I'd certainly like Mr. Brooks to be able to see them as well. Um, Mr. Brooks, are you able to see the easel from where you are? Otherwise, I could have it put in the witness stand too. And okay. then Detective Reglin could just sure. uh, kind of facilitate that. Sure, okay. That will work. And then other individuals have brought um, digital photographs that we'll be displaying. Um, so we'll need your clerk's assistance with that. And again, we'll be using uh, Miss Gussie at the back table to accomplish that. All right, thank you. All right, anything else from you, sir, before we start this morning? Um, yeah, just really quick. Um, very quick reference to um, the ICFs. Um, I did address uh, ICF to the clerk, uh, clerk of courts in regards to uh, the record. So I did, I did, um, I should have mentioned that when you was talking about it, but I did, uh, actually I addressed it to her um, personally. I trust she'll respond in due course then. Anything else? Um, not at this time, yeah. All right. I will note that it appears yesterday some restitution information was filed. Uh, was that uh, hand delivered to Mr. Brooks, Attorney Opper? The restitution, restitution. information, yes. was that hand delivered to Mr. Brooks? Yes. Everything we e filed yesterday was provided to Mr. Brooks personally in the jail, Your Honor. I object to that, Your Honor. Um, there were a number of documents that I did not accept. I'll have and mainly the clerk print them off. There is a restitution request from the Waukesha School District uh, totaling oh, that's just one piece of it. Let me look at the letter again. There's a letter from the state and then our um, crime victim compensation request as well. The state will be requesting $47,193.29 to EMC Insurance Company on behalf of the School District of Waukesha and additionally requesting $124,220.65 to crime victim compensation. Um, that's the program through the Department of Justice and supporting documentation, uh, I believe, was also filed. Let me just look for that. Well, say it again, Your Honor. And we'll have it printed off. It was delivered to him yesterday. Whether he accepted it or not, I don't know, but it's available to him in the jail, Your Honor. All right, understood. Well, All right, thank I you. I don't have it, so just for the record. Madam Clerk, we'll print it off, and you'll have it um, I don't, shortly. I don't know if they where they put it after I didn't. And, and the reason why, I, I want to state this for the record, the reason why I didn't is because I didn't know what it was. When it came when it came to my um, cell, I was sleeping, so I was just like, ah, whatever, I'm not getting up. So it wasn't like a exchange or anything like that. It was just like, hey, we got some mail. I'm just like, yeah, I'm not. And he was like, all right. All right, that'll be noted for the record, but again, it is being provided to you this morning. Um, and you'll be able to review that as you see fit. All right, then Attorney Opper, one last question from the court. Do you anticipate making your sentencing recommendation at the conclusion of all of the other statements being made? Yes. All right. With that then, um, you may commence. All right, thank you, Your Honor, and I appreciate that. I do intend to just make some very brief preliminary statements to the court and then uh, commence with the uh, individuals who are present and have asked to speak. I just want to um, state again for the record, we have organized the individuals who want to 
provide a verbal statement to the court into three or four groups. Um, I think we're, we're at three, we're at four. Okay, we're at four groups. Um, we have the first group present in the courtroom, Your Honor, and uh, along with their support persons and family members and things like that. Um, we will uh, go through the first group and then request that brief break to uh, trade out the groups if that's agreeable to the court. I just want the court to be aware uh, and state something that's maybe obvious, but maybe not. The people that are speaking to this court are direct victims of this crime. They were uh, either charged individuals or uh, representatives of the groups, such as the Blazers or the bank or whatever. You're very familiar with these groups now after having gone through trial. These are people uh, with a, you know, a direct link to either someone that was hurt or injured or killed. Um, that's who we're presenting to you today. Obviously, there could have been thousands of people um, that would want to share with this court their thoughts, impressions, and the impact that this crime had on them. We did not turn anyone away, but some individuals did contact our office and expressed a desire to contact the court or I'm sorry, to speak to the court, we directed them to write the court a letter if they felt it was appropriate. I don't know if the court received any such um, written materials. We also provided some written impact statements on behalf of our charged victims. I know the court has those and has uh, very likely reviewed those already. Um, so I don't wanna spend a lot of time with my thoughts and impressions right now because I think what's really um, most important for is for this court to hear from these families and the reason I say that is you know judge that at trial um, we asked some cursory questions about the injuries that were received and the impact that these crimes had on the individuals that were directly involved but we didn't spend a lot of time on that and I think um, this court is really going to be astounded to hear the level of injury that many of these uh, people suffered, many children suffered, the impact, the life-changing impact it's had on them. So this will be different and new information than what we presented at trial. And I think it's very relevant and important for Your Honor to consider um, when you're uh, uh, deciding on a fair and appropriate sentence and knowing the gravity of the crime, the seriousness of the situation and the impact that it had on the community to hear from these families directly as to what they went through. And again, um, this was touched on at trial as far as the physical injury versus the emotional injury and the trauma that has been suffered. So um, I think um, that will be important as well for this court to appreciate uh, this defendant's conduct we're past the guilty uh, finding. He's been convicted. Now it's time to talk about what exactly his conduct did to our community and to these families. So um, these uh, speakers are grouped, not necessarily within um, the groups as they march down the street, but there is some logic to, um, so we're not gonna bounce all over the place is what I'm trying to say. We'll, we'll try and uh, clump them together uh, to make the most uh, sense to the court and um, with the court's permission. We have a set lineup, of course. Uh, we may need to um, be a little bit fluid depending on somebody's uh, emotional state or um, desire to speak when it's their appointed turn. There are some individuals that have said they're going to try and read their statement to the court, but they may not be able to get through it, in which case I believe Jen Dunn will um, step in and, and read the remaining remainder of the statement for them. Thank you. Um, would you please confirm on the record that the state has complied with victim rights? Yes, we will confirm that, Your Honor. Thank you. And then please give the court a heads up when a juvenile is next yes. so that uh, the cameras can take the appropriate steps as well. Yes, absolutely. And for the record, we did provide a list to the uh, cameramen from Court TV or uh, individuals from Court TV and uh, we're trying to assist them in that regard as well. We want to thank them again um, for their uh, high degree of concern for obeying uh, the court's order and their respect and uh, uh, 
intention to strictly adhere to uh, maintaining the privacy rights of these victims. So they've been uh, absolutely very professional in that regard, Your Honor. Thank you. And then just lastly, because I would like to keep track and obviously I will honor however they want to introduce themselves, but if you could also tell me which victim they relate to, if it's not self-evident, sure, that would be great as well. And I'm going to keep a list. Okay. Right, Thank go you. Go ahead. All right, then. I believe our first speaker would be Lori Loken. And if it pleases, is this on? How's the volume? There we go. If it pleases the court, Your Honor, one of my staff will actually go let Court TV know when a minor is coming next. Thank you, I would appreciate that. All right. And uh, are you going to say the victim that you relate to, or I can tell the court this is for victim UU? Thank you. Good morning. I'm addressing the court. Is the microphone on? Yeah, it is. Okay. I'm addressing the court, but I also want to direct my comments to Daryl Brooks, Jr. My name is Lori Locken. I was walking with the Catholic community of Waukesha, my church family. We were celebrating the joy of the season in preparation for the birth of Jesus when you made your decision to drive through the parade route. It truly amazes me that you deny your accountability for the damage and hurt that you have willfully caused. In the years ahead, I urge you to carefully consider the sorrow and grief of the Waukesha community and the world at large. Ponder the loss of lives within our families, the physical and emotional injuries that may never heal, and the sense of personal safety that you robbed from us. As for me, you never gave me a chance. I turned around and it was only seconds before you hit me square on. I clearly remember feeling the impact. The searing pain of that blow is as clear to me today as it was a year ago. Since then, I'm healing as best as I can from the physical injuries, but you took away my peace and my trust, something that I will never regain. My prayer for you is that you will find your salvation in the midst of this evil. I hope that you will repent for the heartache you have caused so many. I too pray that your own personal wounds that you have sustained through your life, which has created so many demons in you, will be healed through this action. Thank you. Thank the court for this opportunity. Uh, I am Bill Mitchell, formerly known as Victim ZZ. To you, Mr. Brooks, I'm charge 52. Um, on November 21st, uh, 2021, I was marching with the Catholic community of Waukesha and the Waukesha Christmas Parade. I was walking in the back and I noticed our banner was flying up because of the wind. So I went up to hold down the middle with, uh, uh, so people could read it. I was joined by a priest uh, who helped hold it down. Uh, we walked almost the entire joyful parade route. When uh, uh, something caught my attention, I turned around and saw a headlight. Uh, and then I was hit. I didn't see the driver and I didn't see the type of vehicle. I flew over the hood and ended up on the ground with eight broken ribs, bruised lung, a fractured hand, finger, and my face was slashed open in several places, requiring stitches. Strangers and friends came to my aid as I lay bleeding in the street. I spent three nights in an ICU. The recovery was slow. My hand still has painful cramps that freeze in my fingers. But I know I was lucky. Others had a lot worse injuries and six died. The impact on my family was great. My wife was home recuperating from surgery when she received the call that was hurt badly and on the way to a hospital trauma center. Not able to drive yet, she had to wait for my son and his fiance to pick her up and drive her to Oconomowoc. And after I was released, she had to do a 180 from patient to be my nurse and help me in even the most basic tasks. 
the stress had slowed her recovery. The continuing pain was a major factor on me giving up a part-time job I enjoyed. We had to rely on family and friends for transportation to doctors for follow-up care for months. Neighbors pitched in to do my yard work and snow removal. Youth from the neighborhood decorated the inside of our house for Christmas. This crime had a ripple effect throughout the community. I do want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for your diligence and sacrifice to be here. I tell people I was blessed because I didn't see the carnage that night. I just saw people helping me. But the jury and all of you had to watch the entire awful scene on videos and hear detailed reports of what happened. I'm sure that's going to stay with all of you. <clears throat> I wanted to thank the judge for her patience and knowledge, the police, Detective Casey, for their thorough investigation and quick arrest, the prosecution for presenting such a strong case. A special thank you to Jen Dunn, Carrie, and the entire victim's assistance team that informed, comforted, and listened to the many people impacted by this tragic event. Finally, I can't bring myself to thank the defendant, but the response to the evil act he did shined a spotlight on how strong, supportive, and loving community we live in. Many people and organizations stepped up to help me. Family, friends, neighbors, coworkers, first responders, Aurora, doctors, nurses, my church family, the Catholic Community of Waukesha, Knights of Columbus, AOH, United for Waukesha Community Fund, Catholic Charities, and so many strangers offered support and prayers. The vast majority of people are good. That's it, then there is Mr. Brooks. He is a unique individual who can have a clear conscience after over, running over kids like speed bumps and killing six people. I would suggest someone without a conscience. He doesn't ask for forgiveness. He doesn't admit to do anything wrong. It is never his fault. When he slapped a woman, it was her fault because she made him mad. I believe if he made it home that night with the red SUV, he would have told his mom the damage wasn't his fault. He was in a hurry and people didn't get out of his way. Some crazy old fat gray hair guy body slammed his hood. I didn't watch all the trial, but the parts I saw, that I saw showed Mr. Brooks had a lack of empathy for his victims or remorse for his actions. The only regrets he seemed to have is that he was caught in the impact on his own life. Free, he would probably not drive through another parade, but chances are someone so self-centered as Mr. Brooks will hurt other people again. The only life he seems to value is his own. I don't believe that Mr. Brooks will think about me or any of his victims ever. The feeling is mutual. I really don't think much about him now, but when the prison door closes on this felon, I won't think about him again. I do hope Mr. Brooks will use the Bible for more than a courtroom prop. He may want to start with the basics that I know his family had taught him, thou shalt not kill, but then he might want to read Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Your Honor, I hope you give him the time to read and study the Bible. Mr. Brooks did everything he could to try to make the trial a circus. It is not a circus. It's not even about Mr. Brooks. Today, the court will hear what the trial is about, the victims. And as former victim ZZ, I would ask the court for a sentence that keeps the defendant, Darrell E. Brooks Jr., away from society forever. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Brooks, my name is Jason Peckloff, and I'm with the Catholic Community of Waukesha. I was one of the victims you hit with the SUV you were driving on November 21st. What you did to my Catholic community and to the city of Waukesha show that you had no regard for life. What makes it more disappointing that you have shown no remorse for what you have done. While you're sitting in prison, I want you to reflect what you have done. I want you to reflect that you nearly took my life. I almost lost the chance to see my wife and kids again. I may have never had the chance to love or hug them again. You intentionally harmed my community, whether it was physical or psychological. You stole our innocent that day. Before that tragedy you created, it was a beautiful day we all experienced and never thought an evil thing like this could ever happen at a parade. My friend, myself, 
and the Waukesha Catholic community were asking parishioners and their families to participate in this parade. Imagine the guilt we must all bear for the rest of our lives. Because of your actions, I was out of work for about six weeks. Then I had to go back part-time because of my sustained injuries. Because of your actions, the multiple lacerations you created leaked out of the bandages and onto my bed, comforter, and sheets. What an awful visual to have. Because of your actions, I could have lost my foot. Thank God my nurse friend was checking on me. Because of your actions, my wife cannot get the images out of her mind of what you have done. You have forever scarred her. Because of your actions, my wife had to hand over my children to our community friends to check on my lifeless body. Because of your actions, my children, four and six at the time, had to go with a grieving friend to find her own child that was in lockdown. It took a while for them to be reunited. Because of your actions, my children are scared to death when they had to cross the same street you drove down. They were bawling and begging me not to cross the street. Because of your actions, I need to reassure my children that, this, that it is safe at parades. Not sure they all feel 100% safe. Because of your actions, not all people in our community are ready to go back to the parades. Again, you stole that innocent from them. Because of your actions, my children are scared of sirens. Because of your actions, they were scared of red SUVs every time they saw one. They cried and hid. Because of your actions, I walked into the entrance of my children's school and felt like a triage unit. I saw children on crutches and a walker. What an awful image to be burned into my memory. Because of your actions, I feel terrible. I could not help my community and the city by testifying during the trial. Your cowardly actions did this. Your actions forced my family to seek out therapy and resolve in their minds what happened. Your actions made us second guess what we did that day. What could we have done differently? During this trial, you show no remorse. It makes you look like a monster. During the trial, you show little regard and respect to the court. It makes you look disrespectful. During the trial, you treated multiple witnesses terribly. You were trying to twist the words of our pastor, who is a man of the cloth. You made a comment to a witness you injured that he was walking fine now. It makes you a callous jerk. Despite what you have done to my community, I forgive you. Forgiveness does not remove the need for justice. Justice must be served and you must go to prison. My prayer is that forgiveness will heal your wounds and the wounds for the city. Thank you. Thank you sir. <clears throat> My name is Margaret Petulis, victim BBB, count 54. I know I am blessed to be here today to present my statement to the court. Daryl Brooks's choices on November 21st, 2021, took a toll mentally, physically, and emotionally on me as well as affecting my family. I remember the moment someone yelled car and I turned to see a vehicle behind and to the right of me. My thought was, what is this vehicle doing here? After that moment, I have a void in my memory. My mind won't let me see what happened. I remember my thoughts. Oh my God, this can't be happening. Please, not my hip, not my leg. 
My next memory is laying, lying on the ground with a person from our group and a nurse talking to me and asking how I was. They worked on keeping me calm and from going into shock. I will always be grateful to them. Every night I would lay awake and replay the incident to see if I could get the memory back. Months of counseling and the passage of time have helped me be somewhat okay with not knowing what happened. One of my fears is that when I least expect the memory, least expect it, the memory will return. After being impacted by the vehicle, I was laying on the ground with severe pain to my left leg. Emergency people stopped by and one questioned whether I had been shot and all I could think of is why would I have been shot? I was eventually lifted into a police SUV and taken to Waukesha Memorial Hospital. I was examined and was released after being diagnosed with a broken bone in my left foot. I was instructed to wear the boot provided by the hospital, sit in a recliner, keep my leg elevated and not put any weight on my left foot. I was instructed to follow up with an orthopedic doctor the following week. I went home and found it very hard to get from the car into the house. I couldn't figure out how to walk without putting my left foot down on the ground. My stomach was nauseous from the pain medicine. My husband and daughter assisted me into the house and sat me in a chair. I immediately passed out and when I came to my husband and daughter were concerned that I had had a stroke. They called 911 and I was transferred to Aurora Trauma Center. I was examined head to toe and again released with a diagnosis of a broken bone in my left foot. We live in a tri-level and I was able to get to the lower level where there is a bedroom, a bathroom and a family room. For the next six weeks, I would sit in the recliner with my left leg elevated and ice packs applied. I also slept with a wedge that kept my leg elevated while I was sleeping. After experiencing more pain in my left leg, I was sent for an ultrasound and the ultrasound found a hematoma on the inside of my left leg. Standing up was extremely painful even without putting pressure on my left foot. It would take me a couple of times of standing and then sitting back down on the side of the bed until I could bring myself to hop on my right leg using a walker for balance to get to the bathroom or to the recliner. My husband had to help me in and out of bed due to the extreme pain in my lower left leg. I couldn't dress or undress myself, take a shower, go to doctor's appointments or to mass without his help. Every day he had to apply gauze wrap and an ACE bandage to my left leg to cover the blisters so that they, as they would burst, they were covered. He then applied the boot sock and a boot. Every day for s several weeks, he had to prepare all meals and bring them down on a tray to me. We were fortunate that he was working from home during this time. I had orthopedic appointments and three rounds of physical therapy. I am still going through physical therapy. After the bone healed in my foot, I was still experiencing pain in my ankle. The pain limited me. I had trouble walking normally, could not walk any great distance, Going up and down the stairs was best sitting on the stairs and going down that way. As time went on, I was frustrated that I could not perform the simple act of walking down the stairs. Before going to the third physical therapist, fr frustration set in as I thought I would always have pain and not be able to do all the things I enjoyed, such as pickleball, stand-up paddleboarding, kayaking, walking miles, and traveling. My third round of physical therapy found that the whole left side of my body was twisted from the impact of the vehicle. After 10 and a half months and three rounds of physical therapy, I am now 95% back to normal. All the months of suffering and thinking no one would be able to figure out what was wrong, I was worried that the pain would remind me forever the choices Daryl Brooks made on November 21st, 2021. I wanted my life back. During this time of feeling, if a healing, I felt isolated and frustrated that the Advent and the Christmas season were happening and I was unable to decorate, shop, or participate as I usually would during the holidays. Emotionally, since being struck by the vehicle driven by Daryl Brooks, I have felt like a victim. Every day I was reminded that I was limited by physical pain and loss of self. The world went on, but I was stuck, not able to move forward. Today, I am taking the final step forward in my journey of coming out the other side of this incident. Life is starting to look like it was before November 21st, 2021. I know I am not the same person that I was before this trauma, but now I have an enhanced appreciation for life and a stronger sense of spirituality. 
I am grateful to have a supportive family, supportive friends, and my Catholic community of Waukesha who have all walked this road with me. Forgiveness is a choice. I know that I can forgive you, Daryl Brooks, without forgetting the trauma you caused, without you apologizing and acknowledging your actions. This may take some time for me to accomplish, but after today, I will not let your actions take over my life. I will move on. Regarding sentencing, Your Honor, I would like to request that due to Daryl Brooks's total lack of concern for human life on November 21st, 2021, that for each count that the jury returned a guilty verdict, Daryl Brooks received the maximum sentence for each of those counts. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, my name is Jeff Rogers. Um, my children were victims U and V. I'm a father of four, three of which were marching with me in the parade last November. Two of my children were struck and injured. I also serve as the president of the Waukesha Blazers baseball and fast pitch organization and was a couple, couple months into that job at the time of the parade. I've debated whether or not to read a statement for this sentencing. At the end of the day, I felt it necessary to have my voice heard for my sake, for my family's sake, and for the Waukesha Blazers' sake, and for all the other victims. I'm here today with families that I love, and I'm so sorry that this happened. First of all, this event was completely avoidable, and from my perspective, there has been zero remorse, sympathy, or acknowledgement of the victims by the defendant. All he had to do was stop the vehicle when he saw the crowd, and none of these lives would have been changed forever. For this reason alone, he needs to be locked up for the rest of his life. But enough about him. This is about the impact on, of the event on me, my family, and our Blazers organization. I'd like to speak as a father, first of all. The impact this has had on my family and I has been immense. This last year has been full of confusion, irritation, anxiety, and depression. We haven't been able to live a normal life. The trial has been dragged out and literally we were pulled back through to relive everything, all because this person wouldn't admit it like a man and take what was coming to him. My kids are some of the strongest people I know and they have proven that through the faith in God they've displayed throughout. However, the impact this has had on them literally makes me sick. No more parades, that joy is gone. This is something that will never leave them. I'm still learning things today as well about what they heard and saw that day. I pray every night that God continues to strengthen them to push through and know that he is in control. That night when we got home, I'll never forget Caden looking at me with glassy eyes. He looked up at me and said, I'm really glad Riley is okay, and started to cry. When my wife Stacy sat on the chair next to me that night, it felt different. She hugged me longer than normal and a lot more firm than normal and said, thanks for keeping our kids safe. Everyone saw on the videos that were shown, we're literally inches away from losing three out of our four, four children and myself included. I thank God each day that he spared us and provided the adrenaline, courage and strength to get my kids out of the way, gather all the kids we could and pray together. My wife was going to come with us that night along with our toddler son. I play things in my head over and over, imagining what could have been if she would have come. Where would she have been standing when that SUV barreled through? I have flashbacks most days to Maya's jacket slipping through my hand. If I wouldn't have grabbed it the second time, I know what the outcome would have been. Riley still has trouble sleeping with some nights getting out of bed six, seven, eight, nine times because she heard a noise or doesn't feel safe. A few days ago, I was one-on-one -on -one in the car with her and I finally apologized for not finding her right away. Thank God our friend found her and kept her safe, but as her dad, I've lived with the fact that I couldn't find all my kids that night after it happened. I went way too long not knowing where my kids were, with panic overwhelming me. As a father, I can confidently say that this incident had a year-long impossible impact on me and our family. Are we managing? Yes, of course, as God is in control. Now to speak as the Blazers president. This was a happy gathering and almost the kickoff of my presidency with the Blazers since I was only a couple of months in. We were getting to know each other, welcoming a new coach, our new board members, and overall just ready to advertise our Blazers program. Looking back at the pictures from prior to the tragedy, we were so happy. So much love and camaraderie. We were ready for an awesome season. I spoke just prior about my perspective during the event as a father of three kids, but as the president of our organization, the weight of the moment to find an account for everyone felt like it was on my shoulders. We had nearly 35 people there. I knew I had lots of help and for that I can't thank the other parents and coaches enough. The moment was a blur 
and gathering and putting kids up in the truck was the priority. From there, the kids I could find huddled with me in the theater and we said a prayer for those injured and being attended to. I knew that the next few days were going to be intense, but I never fully grasped how crazy the following days, weeks, and months would be. The amount of turmoil and struggle for our Blazers organization was literally insurmountable. From the moment of the incident, the amount of media and law enforcement interaction was exhausting and unending. Media showing up at my door asking for individual participants' status, unbeknownst to them that two of my children were hurt. There was nonstop email flow, phone calls, planning, coordinating, and filtering through things. It was endless work. This job went from something I truly loved from my biggest passion in life to something I cried about for months. I went from giving speeches on Facebook Live about how cool our new indoor facility was to speaking at Jackson's funeral. From there, the community really pulled together. The amount of love and compassion that came our way was also unending. It was honestly overwhelming. For that, we cannot thank this community enough. Finally, I wanted to briefly touch on the true impact this has had on me. My faith was challenged over the past year, but I can confidently say it's stronger than ever. The hardest part about the whole incident was not knowing where my kids were, not having answers for what just happened, not knowing if more danger was coming. I knew I had Maya next to me, but when I went back and forth screaming for Caden and Riley, that horror plagues me every day. I go back to those moments quite often, and when I watch the videos during the trial, it brought back all those feelings. Pure and utter terror, that's what it was, and that's the impact it still has today. Finally, in closing, I'm a man of faith and wanted to share two Bible passages which have pushed me through. First of all, my confirmation passage, Joshua 1.9, it reads, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And secondly, I met with my pastor prior to testifying, and he provided me with an excellent part of scripture, Philippians 4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understandings, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Thank you for listening, and may God strengthen us all. Thank you, sir. My name is Jessica Gonzalez, and this is my husband, Juan Gonzalez Lopez. We represent the Blazers organization, as well as many others, and you could even argue the state of Wisconsin. Last night, as I thought about my statement, my son scooched over on the, cou over on the couch and snuggled into me. He laid with his head on my lap, and I stroked his hair. We stayed like that until it was time for bed. He knows we're here today, and it was as if he knew we needed a little extra love last night. Moments like these should be pure with love and affection, but since November 21st, they are mixed with flashes and images of what could have been. Mama, I'm here. I was on the other side. This is one of the memories and words that I'll never forget and hear dozens of times a day without warning. The relief I felt hearing those words on November 21st was devastating, but I found my son unharmed. That should be the end of the story, right? We're fine, right? Physically, yes, but fine is a word we use when people ask us if we're okay, but we're not. It was only a short time before we had readied for the parade, got our hot cocoa, and took pictures to snap a shot of the fun about to be had. Before the parade, I left him with his teammate and new friend Jackson at the Blazers drop-off spot and walked my daughter to her dance team location. With my mother-in-law visiting from Mexico, she was excited for her first Christmas parade. Stationed at the corner of the Clark Hotel with friends, my daughter's dance group waved with smiles as they passed us. She was headed to the library where I would pick her up. The dancing grannies 
one of our favorite groups, performed flawlessly as they passed us. My son's baseball group was after the extreme dancers who were within with sight. Then the gasps and screams came from everywhere and the red SUV sped past us. I yelled stop and put my hands out like I had the power to make it happen. I felt like I was punched in the stomach when I realized the SUV came from the direction of my son's group. Panicked and lightheaded and knowing my daughter was safe, I ran to find my son. Running through the streets, my legs felt like they had a life of their own. I found Jackson first. I saw his little body in his blazer's jersey. His eyes looking up, looking nowhere. I knew he was hurt badly. Seeing Jackson on the ground, I began looking for my son amongst the rest of the bodies. I screamed hysterically, searching frantically. What ifs filled my head. I heard mom from so many directions, but it wasn't him. Finally, it was. I turned to see him with other blazers who were in the team truck. He called out to me. Mama, I'm here. I was on the other side. <laughs> yes, I found my son unharmed, but after, the chaos continued. We ran. I covered his eyes as we rushed back to our group. I called my husband to tell him something terrible had happened, but had no words to explain. Headed for the library, we were told there was an active shooter. We ran again. I covered my son's head with my arms so bullets would hit me first. He cried. I tried to assure him and myself that things like this don't happen. At the library, I ran up the stairs and shouted for my daughter, who was huddled with a friend and her daughter. Yes, I found my children unharmed. But after, the pain and terror continued. After the parade, we discovered people had died and that several people in my son's group were hit, including his coach and teammate. We learned that my son's teammate was in critical condition, but I already knew this. I still see his eyes without closing mine. What does it feel like to attend a funeral of a child your age? I hate that my kids know. I hate that I didn't get a chance to cheer on my son and Jackson during the baseball season last year. I hate that my son said it was weird having one less teammate. For more than a week, it was late nights to avoid sleep and our family of four piled into one bed. There was no question this was a traumatic experience. Counselors were available. My son didn't want to talk about it. And today still doesn't. I tried to return to work. I tried to return to teaching. I couldn't make it through a day without feeling hypervigilant startling at every noise, having a panic attack from the sound of a door, shout, thud, gasp, anything and everything. After the parade, I couldn't make it through a day. My joy disappeared. I felt guilty. I had no right to feel joy since my son and daughter were alive and others were not. I was open about questions my kids had, but I cried and screamed in agony when they weren't around. I overreacted, shouting and pulling my kids near in the parking lots and streets or any time I saw a car come within a quarter mile away, convinced they all had ill intentions. PTSD throws all the punches. I left my career to work intensively on healing in a program for PTSD. I have only just returned to the workplace.
only just a month ago. Something quieter. Something with less action. Because after almost one year, some days still feel like November 21st was yesterday. Intrusive memories, hypervigilance, nightmares, anxiety, panic attacks, depression, anger, guilt, shame. These are all things I and others live with daily because Daryl Brooks drove through our joy and turned it to terror. When he suggested he could have hit more, he was wrong. He hit everyone. The toll this event has taken on everyone, physically hurt or not, is tremendous. And it sickens me to know that there are so many others with a similar story as ours. I know some today may offer forgiveness, but for me, forgiveness is for accidents, for mistakes or poor choices that the offender expresses remorse for their actions. Daryl Brooks offers no remorse, but he did search for sympathy for himself. I cannot offer forgiveness. I will not. Daryl Brooks should be held accountable for every second of pain and trauma he inflicted on all of us that day, including the many years inflicted already on Ms. Patterson. Free, he is and always will be a danger to society. With that, Your Honor, I ask that the full sentence is issued and he spends the rest of his days in prison without the chance of parole. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> I'm Lindsay Conkle, and my family walked with the Waukesha Blazers. November 21st, 2021, my family walked in the Waukesha Christmas Parade. My boys were dressed proudly in their baseball jerseys, <clears throat> streets lined with smiling faces. The crowd was happy and excited. In a split second, excited cheers turned into sounds of screaming and horror. A trail of bloody bodies were left laying in the road. My family was not physically injured that day. We somehow dodged the path of the car by inches. Our mental and emotional injuries were severe and they remain a struggle for us every day. We have the image and the sound plow of an SUV plowing through people burned into our minds for the rest of our lives. My children were separated and I ran through a trail of bloody bodies that were left laying in the road. I will not forget how many people I saw, some seizing in an intersection, some unconscious and some not. My children cried themselves to sleep for weeks after and still do. They still wake up with nightmares, as do I. They could not walk in a parking lot without clinging to me, shaking and terrified that a car would try to run them down. We suffer from major panic attacks and PTSD, all from a day that was supposed to be happy and exciting. As parents, we have to try to help cope with, with our children while we do not know how to cope ourselves. My children, my family, and I, and every person that we know will never be the same after that day. There were many people that were fortunate, fortunate enough to walk away unharmed. However, Jackson Sparks was not one of those people. A child, eight-year-old, walking next to his big brother with his whole life ahead of him. The next time my children wore their baseball jerseys was to a funeral. A funeral for an eight-year-old boy, their friend, their teammate, that they have spent many days playing and making memories at while at their brother's baseball games. His family and friends will never see his smiling face light up a room, and his team will never be able to celebrate a win with him on the baseball field ever again. Every moment of Jackson's life that was ahead of him was ripped away by Daryl Brooks. You, Daryl Brooks, you hid in a children's playhouse and ditched your hoodie in a sandal. That playhouse happened to be my children's at the house we just moved out of a couple of months prior. That playhouse was built for them, built for my sons, and you hid there after you left their friend and teammate lifeless in a road along with many others. 
You didn't just get lost in a parade route. You disregarded police and the safety of hundreds, and you disregarded life. You very selfishly ripped away the joy from the families who were there just to bring joy to others. There are many holes left in our community, but our community has grown stronger and we all have each other. You, however, will have no one. You will have no one in a cell where you belong for the rest of your life. Thank you, Judge Doro, and we ask that please, he never see the light of day again. Thank you. My name is Sherry Sparks. I am Jackson and Tucker's mom. I stand here today with my son Tucker and my husband Aaron. I'm here today to represent my family, but mostly for my boys, who were both struck down by the red SUV on November 21st. I want to give a voice to our son Jackson Sparks. Our family is forever changed. We are hurt, angry, traumatized, and broken. November 21st was a day that was supposed to be fun and filled with laughter and smiles. Instead, it became a nightmare full of fear, screams, and tears. Put the first one up. My boys were walking in the Waukesha Christmas Parade with their baseball teammates, friends, and coaches. It was a chilly and windy day that day, so we all layered up and prepared to kickstart our holiday season. We met up with our Blazers group, decorated the truck, prepared the buckets of candy and flyers for the boys, took some group photos, and then I left to go find my seat near the end of the parade route and wait for our group while enjoying the parade. I had no idea then the nightmare that was coming my way. Nor did I know that it would be the last time I would hear Jackson's voice and see his smile. I wish I would have known then that the hug he gave me before I went to sit down was the last hug I would ever get from him. I would have held on to him a lot longer. <laughs> After the red SUV flew past us, it was pure chaos. I will never ever forget the horrible sound of the car hitting bodies and the thud of bodies landing on the ground. I immediately grabbed my favorite plaid blanket, ran up the street to find my boys. What I found shook my world. I saw Jackson first in the arms of a police officer. He was running him to get a medical attention. My husband was right behind them and told me that Tucker had been struck also. Pointed me back to the direction where Tucker was. Can you do the second photo, please? That's Tucker underneath my blanket there, the plaid blanket. My world came crashing down at that moment. I wanted to scream. I wanted to throw up and cry. Adrenaline kicked in and I went to find my boy. I spotted Jackson's baseball hat lying in the road first. Then Tucker's hat. Then I found Jackson's shoe, which kind of led me to Tucker. I finally spotted him. He was one of the many bodies lying in the road covered in blankets. I recognized the shoes on his feet. That's how I found him. They're sticking out from under the blanket. I stayed at Tucker's side as he lay in the road waiting for an ambulance to come back for him. He was semi-conscious, but we couldn't move him without a backboard due to his head being injured. They had run out of backboards. Luckily, a nearby shop owner slash hero dragged a door out of her shop to roll him onto so we could get him out of the cold and get him warm. An hour laying out in the cold road where he was thrown from impact. You can go to the next photo, please. This is what we were facing next. Both boys had traumatic head and brain injuries. They both ended up in the ICU at Children's Hospital. Their rooms just a few doors down from one another. The next day, Tucker asked us about Jackson, if he was okay or was he worse than himself. Do you have any idea how gut-wrenching 
it is to have to explain your 12-year-old son that his little brother isn't going to make it. His injuries are too extensive for his little body to come back from. And that he won't be coming home with us ever again. Leaving him at the hospital was brutal. To see the confusion, frustration, and hurt on his face when he's standing over his little brother in his hospital room, taking in all the machines he was hooked up to, it... Tucker remembers everything up until the moment he was hit. He had actually turned around and saw the SUV coming towards them. He said Jackson was right next to him. He said he saw a few people get hit, and then he tried to run out of harm's way. He didn't make it. Being the protective big brother, Tucker blamed himself. He felt he should have tried to grab Jackson or done more to protect his little brother. It broke my heart to hear him saying these things. Tucker's physical injuries were also severe. He still struggles with memory issues and brain processing speed. The mental and emotional damage is severe. Survivor's guilt, PTSD, anxiety, he still gets headaches. His little brother was taken from him. He's suddenly an only child now. He misses his little brother and his playmate. Jackson brought out the silly in him and life will never be the same without him. You can go to the next photo. Every holiday, special event, family function, vacation, there will always be an empty chair or space where Jackson should be. Jackson's absence is very prominent. Every day we face that vacancy and it triggers sadness and trauma. Jackson's life was taken from him and taken from us. Life isn't the same without him and it never will be. This morning, I should have spent the morning making him breakfast, taking him to school, hearing about his day later. Instead, I'm standing here in this courtroom asking for justice for my boys. We came so close to losing both of them that day. I miss Jackson every second of every single day. I feel gutted and broken. It hurts to breathe sometimes. It hurts to live without him here. My mama's soul aches for him. I am emotionally and mentally exhausted. The pain I carry with me every day feels so heavy. Yet I have to push forward, still be there to help Tucker heal and move forward with find our new normal. You can go to the next photo, please. As a family of faith, we know this man will face God's judgment someday for his actions. Until then, we feel it is this court's duty and responsibility to all the victims to sentence this man to the maximum penalty allowed under Wisconsin law for each and every guilty charge. We feel this man does not deserve to see freedom in our lifetime, nor our son Tucker's lifetime. We have learned throughout this trial that this man is incapable of empathy or remorse. He has shown no sympathy nor apology for all, the, all of the pain, suffering, and loss of life he has caused to so many. This man not only took Jackson away from our family, he violently ripped Jackson out of our lives. Jackson was only eight years old. Eight. He only had eight years here with us. He was robbed of everything. He will never get to hit a home run, catch frogs with his brother again, meet his wrestling hero, Braun Strowman. He won't ask a girl to prom. He won't go to college, get married, or have children of his own. Jackson will never be able to do any of these things. These milestones will never happen. He was a bright light in our lives. He was very shy to most people, but those close to him, to his family, he was a big ball of energy. He was charismatic and full of light in life. His life was cut out way too short. Jackson and the other victims deserve justice. We deserve closure in order to heal and find our new normal. We hope to achieve that today. Thank you. And thank you, Prosecution Judge Doro. Very much, thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, at this time, Your Honor, we'd like to request a break and bring in the second group. Yes, the court's gonna step off as well while you do that. We'll thank take a, about a 10 minute break. Thank you.
All right, we are back on the record. The state may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, for group two, I believe, Kelly, are you going to go? Victim LLO, and on November 21st, 2021, me and my family's life changed forever. My brother and I were headed to parade. We even scared our parades, not letting us feel safe and comfortable, or even being able to run out onto the road to fetch candy. For example, when I went to the Arrowhead Parade, all my friends were asking me why I didn't want to go out onto the road to get candy, and I said, because of the walkie shop parade. And I was mad because if the parade incident did not happen, I would be able to go onto the road to enjoy something as simple as a parade. When I got to the parade with my friends, I constantly remember to not go onto the road to be better safe than sorry. It is the last thing I want to happen again. How could you do this? Think of your kids. Would you do this to them? I'm just a child with a lifetime left to live. I'm also here from a younger brother, victim KKK. When he is hit by the front of the car, he was traumatized for it. I feel his fear. I feel his pain. Because when I was hit, I broke down into tears too. On the way to the hospital, we had to lay our head down on the floor because we heard there was a shooter. My fingers, my whole body was paralyzed in fear and fright. When we made it to the hospital, I was terrified because I thought I broke my fingers. And when they asked me what happened, I was too busy crying that I couldn't speak. I still to this day. Day after the parade, I couldn't even go to school because of what he did. All my friends were worried about me, texting me, asking if I was even alive. Sometimes I even think of all the others that were hit and how they were in the hospital for longer than me, and how their parents were probably praying that their kids would be okay and that this would be a once in a lifetime happening. I think this should have never happened to us. The day I went back to school, everyone was asking me a million questions every time I was alone. Everyone was babying me, acting like I was, acting like one of my family members was killed. What makes it worse is that almost a year ago, my dog died, and I have lived with it my whole life, so I was extra sad and upset. At that moment, I realized that our family had to find justice against the man who hit too many people and caused a nightmare on November 21st, 2021. I asked for this pain to never be caused again. And I've been asked to read a statement by victim KKK. <clears throat> when I got hit by the car that day, it hurt a lot. I got hit on my right leg and it still kind of hurts now and then. That hit changed my life and it still scares me sometimes when I think about it. I also feel bad for the families who lost someone and everyone who died and was in the parade. And then he drew a picture of a SUV and it says car that hit me and there's a little figure and candy bucket and bottle and me so they handed that to me on behalf of victim KKK <clears throat> Jeff, Your Honor, we need to take a break for a second please I'm sorry I'm sorry it's important. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. We'll do that.
seated. Madam Clerk, do you have the um, <coughs> All right, thank you. At a, shortly before 10 a.m., uh, there was an abrupt stop to the proceedings uh, when I was asked by uh, the sheriff to meet with him, and I was advised at that time that their communication center had received a threat to the courthouse. As everyone is well aware, it's now 11.14 a.m. The sheriff has assured me that this building is quite safe um, very secure were his words, and that he has taken all reasonable measures to secure the courthouse. At this time, I am not going to stop these proceedings. We will continue, um, and I will rely on the Sheriff's Department and law enforcement personnel to advise if anything changes. I apologize for the abrupt disruption previously, um, but I'm confident that we can go forward at this time. I know when we took that break, right before that, Jen Dunn was, uh, had been reading a statement from one of the juvenile victims, and there was a picture that was referenced. I would like to make a request for that picture to be made part of the record. Thank you, Judge. We had anticipated that as well. We're prepared to display that at this time on the monitor. And then will that be filed? Uh, yes, I can file that. All right, go ahead. So again, this is the uh, note and uh, drawing by victim KKK. Can you tell me the age of KKK? Eight years old. Thank you very much. Were you <coughs> completed with that statement, Ms. Dunn? I am completed with victim KKK's statement, and you can now see the drawing that was made by that victim on the bottom of the statement. Thank you very much. Next, I do have the statement of the mother of victim KKK and LLL to read for the court. I am not sure how or where to begin to try and put into words how November 21st of 2021 has impacted my life or my family's life. That was a night that I pray I could forget, say it has not broken me, say that I am stronger than a single moment and move beyond as if it never happened. But unfortunately, as much as I try, this is something that haunts me daily. Our lives forever changed that evening. Mr. Brooks took an evening that was supposed to be filled with excitement, love and holiday spirit and turned it into a real life nightmare. November 21st of 2021, I witnessed the most horrific event I could ever have imagined leaving my house that evening. My children at the time of the parade were 11, victim LLL, 9, victim KKK, and 6, innocent, full of life, love, compassion, and excitement for the holidays. That evening, Mr. Brooks stripped this from my children, leaving them physically hurt, scared, angry, confused, traumatized, and forever changed with the visions of what happened that night. I saw absolute fear and pain in my children's eyes they should never have to, had to experience in their entire life. I saw my daughter, victim LLL, lying in the road crying and yelling, who would do that? I saw my son, victim KKK, flipped on his back, crying in pain, not being able to move or feel his legs. I remember knowing we weren't safe and needing to leave, telling my children to run as fast as they could and mentally knowing we needed to run, but physically feeling my body pull me back, not knowing if I am running them to safety or back to danger. I remember seeing parents laying on top of their children in fear and trying to protect them the best they could from what was happening. I remember sitting at every stoplight while, my dr while driving my children to the hospital trembling to the point the car was shaking. In complete fear, every car pulling up beside me was the person who hit my children. Yes, Mr. Brooks, I remember. I watched my son not be able to sit alone in a room for weeks. I watched my children not be able to sit still without being anxious and fidgeting for months. I watched my children wake up with nightmares to this day. 
I saw gut-wrenching guilt on my husband's face for feeling like he didn't protect his family. And to this day, I feel anger and hatred more than I realized I could ever could for a person I have never even met. But aside from all of that, I am thankful. Thankful that by some miracle, my family and I walked away that evening. Although I could not attend most of the trial in person, I did view either via Zoom or on TV. I viewed everything from the pre-trial, jury selection, and trial itself, and I am disgusted that a grown man could act the way Mr. Brooks acted during all of this. Mr. Brooks claims he was raised a Christian and his mother raised him better than he was acting at the beginning of the trial, but Mr. Brooks continued to be rude, selfish, and disrespectful from sleeping during court, endless interruptions and outbursts, rude comments, facial expressions, and lack of remorse for his actions and how he was treating everyone in court from the prosecutors, victims, witnesses, and judge herself. I never thought Mr. Brooks could make myself or my family feel victimized all over again, but he did. I keep remembering how Mr. Brooks was upset the detective in the investigation asked to speak to one of his children. I asked myself, it's not okay to speak to his child, but it's okay to intentionally hit two of my children and drive away? That's okay? Why my children? Why any children? How could someone do this? How could someone have no compassion for the victims, the families? We deserve answers. Our children deserve answers, true and honest answers. Never once did I see true remorse for anyone but himself or his family during the trial. Mr. Brooks also stated something along the lines of anyone who knows him or spends enough time with him knows he would never do something like that. But Mr. Brooks, you absolutely did. Mr. Brooks hit my children and so many more people and never once stopped. Not only did he kill, injure, and traumatize so many that night, he decided to victimize everyone again by forcing them to not only testify as to what happened because he felt compelled to plead not guilty, but he also forced these victims and family members, including my husband, to face the monster that did this and answer the questions he felt the need to ask. How can someone face each person on the stand knowing what was done that night, question them as if they were the ones on trial when all of the victims and witnesses were doing that night were creating memories? Unfortunately, memories were created, but not the memories I planned to have with my children. Instead, the fear I have seeing a maroon SUV driving towards myself or my family is now paralyzing. Seeing a vehicle drive too fast down any street makes me physically sick to my stomach. <clears throat> my children panic at the sight of an emergency vehicle. Seeing people run and yell unexpectedly, even if just for fun, makes my heart drop and my mind brings me back to the night of the parade hearing the screams, Yells for help and cries from that night will haunt me until the day I die. Those are the memories I have from the night. The only good that has come from this is Mr. Brooks will never be able to hurt another person outside of prison ever again. The guilty verdict and hopefully life plus sentence will protect anyone that may have been hurt by Mr. Brooks in the future, and that I can be thankful for. Please, on behalf of myself and my family, we ask Mr. Brooks to be sentenced to the fullest extent. Mother of victim KKK and LLL. Next to speak will be victim S. Go ahead, Mr. Brooks. Um, I'm taking some notes and I was wondering, um, it was a little confliction there. Is uh, victim KKK eight or nine? I can't answer that, sir, but that was a written statement read from the mother of victim KKK. I apologize, Your Honor. I was just taking notes. <clears throat> All right, go ahead. My name is Kelly Grebo, and I was walking in the Christmas parade with my daughter, Adelia, on the 21st. I'm not one for public speaking, obviously, I'm very nervous, but I was given a chance to be the voice for my daughter, and, and I. That is what fueled me to stand here today. Now I can only <clears throat> tell you our story, but I believe the tragic events of that day have affected many of us in a similar manner. I can honestly say I have never felt the hatred I do for one person like I do this man. The very man that drove his vehicle into my nine-year-old baby girl who was excitedly walking in the Christmas parade. She was so excited to dress up that day as Cindy Lou Who. We spent weeks figuring out costume, her costume and picking her hairstyle 
she was excited to have her hair and makeup done and to help spread holiday cheer. To see her friends and her family that were there to be spectators at the parade that became witnesses to this horrible act themselves. So many lives were changed that day. Although many of us, for the most part, have healed physically, emotionally, many of us have been scarred. I have questioned whether those emotional scars will ever truly go away, remembering the roller coaster of emotions that day. And after being struck myself lying on the ground and seeing the tires pass directly in front of my face and just waiting for the pain to begin, being filled with absolute fear of not knowing where my daughter Adelia was or if she was okay, then running only to find her the way I did, the way so many of us found our loved ones that day, lying helpless on the cold, hard ground. My knees buckled the minute I got to her. Seeing my child, sorry. Seeing my child that this so-called sorry excuse for a man ran a 3,000 pound SUV into her tiny little body. There are so many times when I close my eyes, I still see my baby girl laying in the street helpless, not moving, just staring in complete shock, not even recognizing her own grandparents when they came to her side. Seeing that look in her eyes will forever be embedded in my mind. As a parent, we are supposed to be able to protect our children, and that day many of us were reminded of the ugly in this world, that no matter what we do, there will always be monsters like Darrell Brooks that are lurking around corners, just waiting for a chance to play those parts in our nightmares. Yet even after causing this much pain and destruction, he wasn't even happy with that. He didn't stop there. He took it upon himself to be his own representation, knowing full well he would be given the chance to question us as victims and rip open the wounds once again and show no remorse. I can tell you, sitting on the stand that day, reliving the horrific events, Having him look in my direction brought up so many memories and emotions of that night. Hearing his voice made me cringe with disgust and anger. He changed our Adelia that day. He stole her innocent, happy look on life and replaced it with fear and hate that no child at the now age of 10 should ever feel. Although those feelings are warranted, she was forced that day to see the ugly in this world also. And her joyous outlook on the holiday season was stolen. I'm not sure if she will ever again attend another parade, let alone a Christmas parade. I don't know when the unexplained loud noises will ever not, make, not take me back to that day and make me jump, make my heart rate increase. However, I do know every day is a new chance. We have to take back our lives and give this man no more than he has already taken. We are now stronger than we ever imagined we would have to be as a family and as a community, and that we that he cannot have. He does not deserve that. What Darrell Brooks does, however, deserve is to be does deserve is to be sentenced to the maximum time allotted for each one of his horrific convictions, as he has given us as a community a life sentence of these memories. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Christy, you can write the first one. Yes. Madam Clerk, we need to display, please. Thank you.
system. Just our quick technical difficulties. We did um, swap out computers because we didn't have a power cord, but uh, no, that one might Miss Gussie's going to run and grab the power cord, and then it, it should work. We had, okay. There's a change between what we were using earlier, and that's why probably it's not recognizing the computer. I apologize for the technical difficulties. Okay. We wait for the technology, but we will do that if you want to wait. We'd like to wait if that's all right. No problem. Thank you. Is that it? That is it. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> we may need Miss Gussie back for that. <laughs> just hit case oh. It's PowerPoint, so just hit enter. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Looking back over the last 30, 358 days, some days are a complete blur. Or, or turn the microphone closer to you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Katie Pudliner, <clears throat> mother of Tyler Pudliner. Thank you. Go ahead. Looking back over the last 358 days, some days are a complete blur, others are as vivid as yesterday. At 4.39 p.m. on 11-21-21, changed my life, my sons, my family, my friends, and the Waukesha community. During the closing arguments, the defendant spoke of family. His grandmother released her statement to the media speaking of family. Through the past 360, 300, 358 days, we have heard from the Brooks family that the defendant has a mental illness as a reason for his decisions that evening, except the decision making goes back further than that. It seems the decision was made not to get help, not to stay medicated, etc., and said to use it as an excuse for poor, selfish decisions. My family almost lost the only son, the only grandson, the only nephew, and that was not our decision. As a parent, I have carried the guilt that I debated with my son that he had to go to the parade that day. It was mandatory for his grade. The Packers were playing. It was cold and windy. I had to use a life teaching moment. He made a commitment to the band. This was all part of it. He, reluctant, he left reluctantly. I talked to him shortly after I found a parking spot downtown to make sure he was warm enough and told him the general area where I was going to look for a spot to watch the band perform. From 4.33 to 4.34 p.m., I watched the South Band march and perform in front of me. As I was packing up my blankets and chair into the wagon, I noticed what I thought was between a 2008 to a 2012 maroon red Ford Escape driving extremely fast past me. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I remember making the mental notes about the vehicle, the driver, turned to a friend sitting with me, and we were both in awe. Then we heard the screams and the sounds of things being hit, like when you bump into a construction barrel on the freeway. From 446 to 458 was complete chaos, fighting the crowd of people running out of the area screaming shots fired, trying to find my son. As I approached the intersection of Main Street and Barstow, the area went completely dark, maybe only in my mind, as I searched for my son, asking people if they knew where he was. A familiar voice behind me said, he's over here. I turned to see him laying in the street with his feet pointing north. First, enter your pin to unlock the device. Apologies. We had no idea what had happened, only that he was tasting blood and that his stomach hurt. Soon EMTs were there and we went for a run up and down Main Street as
as he was being helped before they had a true plan where they were going to stage the injured. He was taken off the gurney and placed in the street to await an ambulance. This is where we met our first hero of the journey. A complete stranger came to sit with us and help roll my son while he was vomiting blood from his injuries, help to keep him calm and confront and comfort his fears. That was the 18 minutes that felt like an hour. I remember looking around as I waited. Not too far in front of me was a very young officer with his rifle standing guard. To my left were two brothers that we had known from the band and baseball. One lying on the street clearly injured, the other standing by. I felt completely helpless as I wanted to, to go and help them. But I couldn't leave my son injured. They say everything happens for a reason, something I have firmly believed. At 5.16 p.m., we were loaded into the ambulance, as I refer to it as a little ambulance I could. While in the middle of everything, it had a coolant leak. The smell of antifreeze will trigger me forever. We made it out to Oconomowoc, and I learned after that it made another run after that before it died. While my son was whisked away to emergency surgery, I had to start making phone calls, returning text messages, figuring out what was next. While he made it through surgery, will he make it through surgery? How bad were his injuries? After six days at the hospital, we were sent home. My athletic son, couldn't lift, over, lift our cats, pour a glass of milk, put his socks and shoes on. He has a scar almost two foot long. And as a catcher, he questioned his ability to be able to play the sport he loves, the sport that he eats, breathes, and sleeps. After missing school and work for almost two months, we were able to start to get back and work up to a full-time basis over the course of a month. <laughs> One ling lingering injury brought questions if he could play ball for what would be the first full season of his high school career. COVID had canceled and shortened the prior two. April 6th, he took to the field with that bandmate that was lying in the street just a few feet from us just three months earlier. As we tried to find the sense of normal in between doctor's appointments and procedures. Next one. Please. Through the process and the journey of the judicial system, we have found a new family, one that can relate to the horror, the fear, the trauma of that night, changing our lives forever. The criminal complaint had listed 62 named victims, now survivors, six that gained their wings. What it did not include were the 16 jurors that had also become victims of the defendant's actions that night, while the named victims, their families, and friends had to relive that night they were experiencing firsthand. Mrs. Edwards' statement asked that we forgive her grandson, blaming the mental illness, not encouraging him to take ownership for his actions. She said that she lost a grandson, his mother lost a son, his children lost a father. That isn't completely a true statement, as they will be able to talk to him, send him letters, visit him, hopefully in a maximum security prison. They seem to forget there is a mother that can't kiss her son goodnight, a father that can't play ball with his son, a brother that can't fight with his brother and still be his best friend. There are th three children that can't call their mother for advice, go shopping, plan their weddings, or have them watch over them as they reach for their dreams. There are numerous grandchildren that won't get to go to grandma's anymore, get spoiled and sent home, hyped on sugar and love. There are teenagers that had to grow up way too quickly, having to make adult decisions about their future. There are girls that may never dance again without fear, 
their innocence taken away by a selfish decision. There is a grandfather that cannot tell the family stories anymore. He can't watch his wife dance. These families will forever be missing their loved ones. They can't call them, write a letter, or visit them. Nothing will bring back the son, the mom, the daughter, the grandma, and the grandfather to these families. Nothing can restore the innocence lost to, these, to ease their fear. But this community came together to lift up each other up, support each other, looked after those that were in their worst moments, celebrated the wins along the way, returning to the dance floor, dancing in the streets, and playing baseball. The prosecution team did an amazing job representing everyone of the, pl of the plaintiffs in this case. Thank you. The victim witness team was so caring and diligent and keeping us informed being whenever there was a question that came up. Pepper, who greeted us every time we came to the courthouse, she put a smile on everyone's face, brought a little humor or a caring snuggle. You can do the last one, Tom. Your Honor, you are the standard that should be set across the country. Your patience, your diligence will never be forgotten. From the selfish actions Of one person came to a community, came from a, excuse me, from one's selfish actions of one person came a community rising like a phoenix, stronger than ever, stronger together. I ask that you hand down the maximum possible sentence without parole in prison so that everyone in our Waukesha strong community can heal, remember, grow, and never have to look back. <laughs> Is that the it's, yeah, if you just oh, here's Chris. Oh. I'm Tyler Pudliner, uh, victim O. Your Honor, I appreciate the opportunity to speak today and share my impact statement with the court. It has been a long time coming, but I cannot thank the courts enough for giving not only myself, but all of us who have been affected, the opportunity to share our stories. First, I would like to start off with you, Judge Doro. Thank you, Your Honor. We have all been going through these proceedings for almost a year now, and it is almost hard to believe that this is the first time that we've gotten the opportunity to communicate with you directly. I understand now that this is how the process takes place. Now since the beginning of these proceedings, I've obviously gone through a lot of emotions as having been a victim and survivor in this case. I hate to say it like this, but it seems that, that for a greater portion of the year, and especially throughout the most recent proceedings, and my mother can confirm this, I've been somewhat angry towards you, Judge Doro. And I would now like to apologize for that. Maybe it's because I either did not understand or did not want to become aware of how lengthy the process was. There have been multiple occasions where I have gotten very mad or annoyed due to your rulings that either didn't go the prosecution's way or that I personally felt shouldn't have been made. Obviously, there are also multiple occasions where these disruptions that would continuously be, continuously be made by the defendant would take up way too much time and cause way too many delays throughout the trial portion of these proceedings. It would stress all of us out more than we should have ever been, to say the least. I would keep asking my mother, other families involved, the prosecution, and wit victim witness teams, why can't Judge Duro do more to stop the disruptions? Why did she let that one testimony go on for way longer than it should have? But in all thanks to those amazing people sitting behind me, I was able to get the clarification and understanding that I need to calm down and help me understand that we were making steps forward in the process. And I wanted, and that we were going to finally arrive at the finish line as winners. That's why I wanted to start off by thanking you first today, Judge Doro. I am very glad that we have finally arrived at this point in the process where I can say that you did an amazing job throughout the entire process. You have not only shown myself or just the court, but an entire nation and world, um, for, that, for that matter, that you conducted these proceedings with the utmost respect and decorum to all of the parties involved. Lastly, Your Honor, I want to acknowledge your sainthood. 
Your devotion to this trial can never be matched. Your fair rulings, passion for this case, and kindness to everyone is more than everyone could have asked for, and for that I again thank you. You have truly become like a mother and a true hero to this community, and that, we, and for that we appreciate you, Judge Doro. I would also like to thank this amazing prosecution team, Sue, Leslie, Zach, Tom, Christy, and Ryan. You guys have been the glue that has held us together throughout this entire process over the past year. You've all taken extra time out of your day to stay late and either be able to answer all of our questions or just talk and reassure us that even though with all those sleepless nights and countless hours of delay, we would be okay. I can confidently say that I don't think there could have been a better team put together to represent us as the plaintiffs in this matter. Just like Judge Doro, all of you have shown the passion, blood, sweat, and tears and extraordinary effort that has been poured into this case to give us the justice that many have desired and deserve. Consider yourselves true heroes to this community as well. I would also like to highlight Jen and her extraordinary team at Victim Witness Assistance. Again, a group of truly amazing people that I can't say enough words about to describe their amazing work. If we needed a shoulder to cry on, they were there. If we needed to make that late night phone call to get the answers we desired, they answered. We can truly not thank you guys enough for all your hard work and unmeasurable amount of effort that you gave us during this case to our families. And you cannot forget about personally my favorite employee in the entire courthouse, Pepper. You know how they say a dog is a man's best friend. Well, Pepper is an entire community's best friend. I personally, and I'm sure that I could speak for all of us when I say this, could not be more thankful for all the donations that have been made, or have made Pepper possible. Jen and her staff have done an amazing job keeping her in line while she did what any dog does best. It gives us so much unconditional love that for a split second, you feel like all the problems are gone. Once again, I cannot thank everyone who represented us as the state of Wisconsin. You guys did one hell of a job throughout this process and have truly become a special part of this group. Um, finally, I want to take the time to describe how the events that occurred on November 21st, 2021 have affected my family and myself. No one thinks um, that something like those horrendous acts committed by the defendant on 11-2021 will ever happen to you. Christy, if you could please. I want you to look at that, Mr. Brooks. <coughs> That's what you did to me that night. That's us in the ER, waiting. I remember bits and pieces, but that is what happened. If you could go on to the next slide, please, Christy. Throughout the past year, I have become very close to other families involved in this matter. All the pictures there have what kept me going. The sport of baseball and all the other families affected in that community. I've gained more little brothers than I can say and an entire new baseball team to live out the, li the rest of this life with. Next slide, please. I've also met so many new friends post-11-2021. A new grandmother to add to such a wonderful family, a new, another new brother in that instance that have just helped me get through everything. And it's kept us stronger through the whole process. Next slide, please, Christy. I've also gotten to become closer to other groups that were affected. Last Saturday, I marched with the Milwaukee Dancing Grannies in their Christmas parade. Veterans Day. Uh, Veterans Day parade, yeah, my bad, <laughs> sorry. Um, coming together with other groups like this is something that has, again, shown that we are very strong. We are stronger than the defendant, and we are an entire community that has shown that strength. These memories are what have kept us going and will forever keep us going in this process. Next slide, please, Christy. As I stated before, um, baseball is a sport that has specifically kept me going. Wrestling is another love. I've gotten to meet some very cool wrestlers, uh, Braun Strowman, to name a few, or, and Ric Flair. Um, a race car driver, a local race car driver that I pit for at Slinger Speedway has basically been another grandfather throughout this entire process. He spent every day with us at the hospital for the week I was hospitalized, except Thanksgiving. Um, I've gained another brother who's pictured there at that wrestling event with another part of my truly amazing and big family that I've gained out of this. Christian Yelich, a brewer, and my favorite player and now manager of the Brewers Trade Council. You go to the next slide, please. Finally, this right here, this is me and my buddy Eric. We were both affected that day, and we made the return within three months of everything happening to come back and play the sport that we love. We did not stay down, we did not cry, you know, didn't let it get to us. We came back stronger than ever. Yeah, we might have lost, but we played hard and truly showed this entire community that we are stronger together. 
and we are stronger than you. I just want to uh, also address one more thing to Mr. Brooks. These are um, two quotes that have gotten me through this entire process. You can mark it down in your Bible if you want for this one. It's Romans 12, 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The second one, also to go with his grandmother's statement, I picked it up from the book and movie The Shack, written by William P. Young. The quote is, Forgiveness in no way requires that you trust the one you forgive. Forgiveness is not about forgetting. It is about letting go of another person's throat. And I do want to acknowledge that I am letting go of your throat, Mr. Brooks, but I have not forgiven you. Thank you, for your, thank you Your Honor, for the chance to speak today. Thank you to both of you. Hello, my name is Sasha Catalan. I was 17 years old when the Waukesha Parade incident occurred. I was in my last year of high school thinking it was going to be the best senior year ever. Although I pushed through and made it to the end, it definitely was not easy for me or for any of us of that. After that, one night, that changed our lives. I was in the Waukesha South marching band as a clarinet player. How am I doing now? That's really hard to answer because some days I get scared to leave my house, especially now since the holidays are coming around. Even when it's the simplest holidays, my mind always finds a way to go back to that parade incident. Since that day, I don't really know how to act on many events, whether good or bad. What I mean by this is that I don't really know how to show my emotions as much anymore. Before, I used to open up and could easily be read as a book, but now even my mom wonders what goes through my head, and honestly, I wish she knew. But I know that if I were to tell her, she'd be worried for me, which is the last thing that I want. Sometimes I think of what-if situations since that day, that if I were to take the place of one of those people who have passed, if it would have happened better. Although I am grateful to have received a chance to continue and to make something out of my life for the better, I get haunted by these thoughts. I used to never think this way, which scares me the most. Not sure whether to live actively and freely, like as if nothing ever happened, or to watch my back on the slightest things. At school, I sort of didn't want to receive any help for those from those who offered not even my boyfriend, which hurt the most. Everyone hated me seeing, hated me seeing struggle to pick up and carry my books and binders, even carrying my backpack just over a shoulder. I wanted to continue as, norm as normally as I could back at school, but that was never gonna happen. I've never felt so weak like that before in my life. I felt empty and I cried. It was hard to carry those books and everything, so I gave in and let those, including my boyfriend, help me out. Even the basics are hard to do, such as write. Either my hand shakes a little, or I would have, or I would have to use a clipboard for support. Even now, then, my shoulder would pop along with my elbow if I were to simply stretch. I have to relearn how to play my favorite sports, especially soccer, when it came to kicking the ball since I was injured on my right side of the body. I tried to learn to be a lefty, but it was hard. So I decided to heal and to not give up even with the pain of kicking with my right. To this day, it's hard to sleep because sometimes I do dream of that incident. I wake up sweating from my head with a slight fever. I instantly wake up and try to calm myself down as my heart starts to race. I have to hug something instantly to feel that I am not alone and that I am safe, such as stuffed animal, sweater, or blanket. 
My family has been even more worrisome and strict to me, even though I am an adult now. They instantly want to know everything I want to do. We have trust, but since the parade, my mom has been non-stop talking about me possibly getting into a car crash or her never finding me or something because I didn't know where her of a last minute plan to go eat or to simply go to a store. I understand I never want her to worry, but at the same time, she shouldn't have to be thinking of such situations. I want to pursue what makes me happy and to not have limits on myself or to feel not as confident because my mom would say that I'm better off with this since I'm safer. My life has not been easy and I've accepted that it won't be as normal as before. All of this, I still struggle to this day. I just keep moving forward, but I don't know when the nightmares will go away, when I will be completely healed physically and emotionally, having those reenactments of seeing my friends in the band scatter or those on the floor. I just wish, I just wish that day never happened. Definitely not the adulthood I thought I would be having now, <coughs> considering I do not know what to go in for college. This is due to me having now an interest in the medical field or law school because of the Prairie tragedy and wanting to have justice served for everyone in this community. This is how I am to this day. Definitely not the same Sasha as I once was before. I may be stuck finding myself for a period of time, but I am trying my best to not let the incident that, affect us, that affected us all to get the best of me and define who I am and to define who we all are. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I have a statement from Sasha's mother to read and then I have three more statements from members of the Waukesha <coughs> South Band in this group, Your Honor. Thank you. <coughs> and the next one after this is the first. Judge Doro, I want to express in this letter my feelings since the day of the accident, so to speak. My daughter at that time was a student at South High School and a member of the band in which some members, including her, were struck by the truck causing injuries. Since that day, I cannot get out of my head all of the screams of pain, anguish, and terror that were heard along that long street with no end in sight, young children, elderly people, and relatives running to protect themselves. I had mixed feelings, and even worse, my daughter was in the hospital with a lost look and without understanding what had happened. There have been months of uncertainty, of sleepless nights, nervous breakdowns, and foolish thoughts. What hurts me the most is seeing how my daughter has completely changed. From being a girl who wanted so many things for her future, to see her now so quiet, so distant, and still so stunned with many questions, and so many others. The hardest thing to hear is that she would have preferred to give her life for that of some other person who lost their life. For me as a mother, it is very difficult to be able to tell her that everything will be fine when at the time I was not behind her to protect her from everything that happened. I know that many will say overcome it already, but nobody knows what it's like trying to stand on your feet when your world has no floor. I hope justice is done and I am thankful to each and every one of you who has not left us alone policemen, doctors, prosecutors, angels, and all of those people who I could not name who were and are still here to support us. This is just the beginning for many of us and it will be a long road, but I am sure of one thing and that is that we will be able to get back up. Thank you very much. Waukesha, let's hug very tight because our children need us. Mother of victim I. <clears throat> and this next one, they sent us some photos this morning. <clears throat> Are you ready for that? Thank you, Judge Doro, for your patience through this trial. Thank you to the entire prosecution team for being so well prepared for this case. And lastly, thank you to Victim Witness Assistance for looking out for all of us. My name is Donald Teagues, and I am the father of victim Q, or Eric Teagues. Both of my sons, Eric and Tyson, were marching with the Waukesha South Marching Band 
in the 2021 Waukesha Christmas Parade. Eric was a junior and Tyson was a freshman. They were there to play Christmas music for the people and start off the holiday season. That came to a quick end when you, Darrell E. Brooks Jr. drove through the parade killing people, injuring people, and ruining what was supposed to be a beautiful event. And we haven't been told when to do the photos, so Christy, if you can use your judgment, thank you. Darrell Brooks, you hit and ran over Eric along with some of his bandmates. Tyson, his younger brother, was just feet away from Eric when you hit and ran him over. Tyson witnessed his brother getting hit and ran over along with other bandmates. Tyson never left his brother's side during this incident. He even took off his jacket to help keep his brother warm while he laid in the middle of the street. He then had to call his mother and try to explain what had happened. As he stood next to his brother, he saw blood coming out of his ear, nose, and mouth, and his leg that was pointing backwards. He would just keep telling Eric he will be fine and that mom was on her way. He stayed with him until Eric was taken by ambulance to the hospital. Starting that night, Tyson had nightmares and had them for a week. He would wake up screaming and crying. And what made this even worse is he couldn't go to see his brother in the hospital. And my wife and I could not be there for Tyson the first few nights because we were with his brother in the ICU at Children's Hospital. My daughter, who wasn't at the parade, but went with her mother to the parade after Tyson called. She stayed with Tyson at the scene and at home when, she couldn't, when we couldn't be there. She needed to see a psychiatrist to help her deal with what she saw on the streets that day and seeing her brother lying there on the ground not knowing if he would live. She had to be in outpatient care for two weeks to help her through what she saw. Eric was an aspiring baseball player for the Waukesha South baseball team and a select baseball player for Sticks Academy. He was making his final push to get better and wanting to be scouted by colleges to play in college at an elite level. You took that away from him that November day. He spent nine days in the hospital. Three of those were in ICU. Eric suffered from a skull fracture, a major concussion, a C4 fracture, right shoulder fracture, four broken ribs, a partially collapsed lung, T6 through T11 fractures, and a left femur fracture that required surgery. He is lucky to be alive. The C4 fracture could have killed him. The femur fracture could have killed him, or the broken ribs along with the lung collapse could have killed him. His time in the hospital was very hard, dealing with nonstop pain from you hitting him and running over him like he was a speed bump. He had to lay flat for four days and wear a C collar for seven days because of the C4 fracture. He had a chest tube to drain the blood off of his lung for, so he could breathe. He had to undergo surgery to repair his severely fractured femur. On top of all of that, he was dealing with a severe concussion. He could not have any lights on or loud noises. He would have events of uncontrolled vomiting and would spike fevers. When he was finally able to leave the hospital, it was in a wheelchair and he was in that wheelchair for over a month. We had to have a wheelchair ramp built for when we came home. Without the ramp, it would have been very hard to get him in and out of the house. My wife had to take off a month of unpaid leave from work. I had to take off three months from work to take care of him and get him to multiple doctor appointments a week. Darrell Brooks, you stated during this whole trial that you are a man, a God-loving man. You are not. A real man would have stopped when they saw they made a mistake. A real man would have admitted the wrong and would not have put all these families through this pain. A man of God would have stopped, admitted to his wrongs, and asked for forgiveness. You sat there showing no emotions for what you did and pretend that reading the Bible was going to help you. But you, Darrell Brooks, are pure evil that is not fooling anyone. You don't know God, but you better start learning because where you, were, where you are going, you're going to need to start praying a lot. You don't deserve to see the light of day ever again. You should never be able to see your children again. It's too bad this state doesn't have the death penalty because you would be put to the front of the line. I hope you rot in hell, have a miserable existence in prison, and that someone teaches you a true lesson in asking for forgiveness. The next statement is from victim H. It's been nearly a year since the Waukesha parade incident and I know my friends, family, and myself still remember it vividly. Personally, I have an injury that could affect me the rest of my life. Doing normal things like carrying groceries or even my school supplies to classes 
have proven to be more of a challenge compared to what it used to be. And some mornings I'm not even able to lift my arm past my shoulder. It's hard, but I'm living through it because I refused a long time ago that I would have this man, someone who thought of no one and nothing past the incident, control what I can and can't do. I can't remember vividly what happened, just pain sparking up from the back of my head and my shoulder and people standing over me. It wasn't until I woke up the next day after everything and tried to stand up did I realize how much pain I was truly in, and it only got worse the following days. My progress in what I can do with my injuries over this difficult year has been positive. I've rebuilt most of my strength, but I've been told time and again from my family, friends, medical professionals, it may never be what it used to be, and to remember that this may be it. But that's only a possibility to me. Nothing is set in stone. Medicine is a practice because we never have all the answers. I was lucky to have family and friends who could help me physically, but nothing was permanent. All it took was a single thing to throw all progress out the window. If I wake up lying on my side, I already know that that day is going to be painful because simple things like sleeping hurt. Emotionally, the only constant support I've had is that of my friends and family. I've chosen out of my own free will not to see medical professionals for my mental state because I hold the belief that therapy is great and can do many great things for people. But what I do here and now has a bigger impact on myself. Putting a pause on my life to think about what happened to me and the people I know isn't worth it. I wake up at least twice a week to terrors of what happened, seeing and feeling the same things as that night and the days that followed. The endless possibilities of what could have happened, not just to me but others, whether I knew them or not, flood my dreams and scare me to my core. I remember my parents the day after. I had been dead asleep all night from stress and finally running out of adrenaline to find out that they hadn't slept. My father chose to stay up in the living room where I had been sleeping to watch over me instead of recuperating himself. I may not have completely understood then because I didn't want to, but after a year of dealing with the outcome, I understand. Being who I am, I hide what I'm feeling a lot. Right after the incident, I remember friends coming up to me and seeking comfort to which I had no problem with, but there would be triggers in what they would say that would bring me back. But I pushed it away to comfort others. Humor is the world's medicine, and like most traumatic situations in my life, I've apl applied humor to this now. I'm sensitive to who I'm with, but when talking, I try to think of something witty or humorous so that I can jump over the obstacle or burden of trauma, and to put it plainly, sadness. <clears throat> This past homecoming, my friends and I had gone to the dance, and one of my friends was driving us to eat afterwards. The place was on the far side of town, and the quickest route was through downtown. It wasn't their fault at all, but we were stopped because a group of people were crossing the road, and it was right near where I was hit, and I panicked. My vision went blurry, and I had flashbacks of the night. My friends had noticed and helped me through it, and we found a better route. I can't remember a time before having that bad of a panic attack where it's hard to breathe, and knowing the reason behind it is just another reminder I won't be the same, much like most people who were affected. During the time of the trial, I've stayed away from news on what's happening. I've overheard conversations with family members. Sometimes it's brought up within my friend groups, most of which have chosen to be understanding of my choices and move away from the topic. Mentally, this past month, I've had more terrors, not always while I'm sleeping, but when I zone out at school or at home. I never show a reaction because I choose to keep that in, but I do change in how I stand or sit, and I noticed I'm more jumpy around people after experiencing these terrors. Hearing about what happened within this case has been a stressful time for everyone in my family. I tend to not sleep as well as I normally do, even on good nights, and I find myself panicking over small things such as schoolwork more than I ever have. Thank you, Victim H. <coughs> <coughs> And the final statement from the band is from Victim K. At the time of the Waukesha Holiday Parade, I was your typical t carefree teenager. As a 17-year-old at Waukesha South, I had only just begun my senior year, a time that some might argue to be the best year of high school. Sadly, that all changed in a mere instant. I was marching in the parade with the Waukesha South Band, playing the sousaphone, parentheses tuba, when Brooks appeared out of nowhere, plowing into me from behind. He dragged both me and my instrument upon the hood of his vehicle for what seemed like miles, before eventually running me over entirely. Luckily, I was swiftly rushed to Waukesha Memorial Hospital by an officer via squad car for emergency treatment. 
I was completely alone during this time and positively terrified. The ER medical staff was utterly shocked that I had even survived such a forceful impact. I suffered multiple injuries due to the impact, including ligament damages, deep tissue contusions, and both a sprained neck and ankle. Post-evaluation, the doctors explained to me how my instrument had likely saved my life. Saved my life. Those words still echo loudly in my head. While my instrument may have helped to protect me, my life as I knew it was entirely destroyed by Brooks that evening. I spent several weeks on crutches, then followed that up with multiple braces. I felt completely disabled as I was unable to walk or even move without constant pain or assistance from someone. Outside of the injuries I sustained, my entire body ached for several weeks and I felt like one giant bruise. This lengthy loss of mobility ultimately resulted in the loss of my only employment, my part-time job. However, despite my injuries, it was the sheer horror of the events of that night, coupled with the unwanted attention after the parade, which sent me into a downward spiral of misery and depression. Everything I had experienced and continued to deal with had eventually caused me to lose all focus, so I fell behind at school. I simply gave up on my studies and school entirely after the accident. I hated all of the extra attention it brought. Consequently, I was not able to graduate on time with all of my closest friends and peers. That was one of my lowest times, which of course only added to the darkness and depression I was already trying to navigate through. Any physical injuries that my body sustained as the result of this crime do not begin to compare to the mental massacre I have been forced to battle every day since then. My dreams have been assaulted by the images of that night. Bodies were strewn everywhere. Victims were sobbing and crying in pain and fear all around me. My horrific dreams have all but forced me into a constant and chronic state of insomnia. I have been unable to enjoy any form of restful slumber in nearly a full year. I also cannot bring myself to revisit the downtown Waukesha area at all. I become completely stressed even being near the area where I was hit. This is disturbing on a very personal level. My mother is a Waukesha native born and raised. She would often reflect upon her love for this town, the events and parades, and the community as a whole. Our family used to spend so many days together in the downtown area, but not now. Now I become physically ill just considering going downtown, and it hurts to know we can no longer share those special family moments together. In addition, I now suffer from panic attacks in any crowded public settings. I cannot even enjoy a simple sporting event or concert because I have developed a hypersensitivity to screaming crowds. They send me into a complete panic, putting my head on a swivel, and always watching for danger. The PTSD and hopelessness that I continue to suffer as a result of that November day continues to be an ongoing battle, warranting decades of therapy. Mr. Brooke is sheer evil in its vilest form. He should never again know any sense of freedom. I hope that the rest of his days are haunted by the videos, images, and stories shared by each and every victim. I hope every night his dreams are teeming with visions of those six innocent people who perished in the wake. I want him to suffer like all of us has, every single day until he takes his very last breath. His refusal to accept any responsibility for his actions deserves no less. I would strongly urge the court to extend the firmest sentencing possible for every single guilty charge. On behalf of myself, my family, all of the victims, the dearly deceased, and all of Waukesha, please issue Brooks the maximum penalties possible. Victim K. That is the end of this group. All right, thank you. I know we had about an hour or so break, but it, I do think it's also important that court staff and everyone here get a lunch break as well. So we will break for an hour-ish. Uh, I'll plan to be back here at 1.15. All right, thank you everyone, we are in recess. <laughs>